So before we go into this fascinating Darwinian evolution of cryptocurrencies, um, let me ask you sort of a basic programming question. There's a fascinating aspect to your work with Cardano that you use Haskell as a, um, to build the infrastructure, but even stepping back more, looking at this landscape, another place where Darwinian evolution operates, looking at this landscape of programming languages. You as an engineer, you as a philosopher, both, what programming languages do you think are interesting? And more practically, what programming languages, if you were to advise like students today, should they learn? Yeah, so there's the pedagogy of learning how to program and, and to express the theory of computer science. Like you have to learn how to write algorithms, you have to learn what data structures are, you have to be able to do analysis of these things. And that probably, the I think the, the debate is over Python is probably the best language or JavaScript to, to get started with, because they're very useful, the libraries are amazing, there's just tons of online materials. Even MIT is now teaching their introduction to computer science in Python. Uh, and they used to do Lisp. I mean, these these guys were hardcore. I still love Lisp. Oh man, it's great. You know, these, these are your father's parentheses. They're elegant weapons from a <laughs> from a time long ago. Uh, uh, but you know, that's that's a great starting point. And the, it's not about falling in love with a language. It's just falling in love with computing. It's about falling in love with having a dialogue with a computer and thinking about, well, how would I solve that? How would I interact with that? What what does this need to look like? Um, Functional programming is what we've chosen to use for Cardano, mostly because we're living in the academic world. We've written 105 papers. And the problem is you have to translate that work into code. And the gap between an imperative language like a C++ or C and these academic rigorous papers is extremely large. Mm -hmm. And so there's gonna be a lot of semantical ambiguity between those two. And what I mean by that is that you might end up implementing a, a wrong thing. You might think that what you've built is the paper, but the computer's not going to tell you that because the paper's written in prose and maybe typed up in LaTeX or something, but there's no proof chain, evidence chain that you can show that there's no ambiguity. When you look at a functional language, you're a little closer to math. And so as a consequence, the translation of the papers that we spent so damn long writing and writing proofs about and so forth to code is much smaller. Now, the downside is these functional languages tend to be a bit more academic and they tend to have not necessarily the best Windows support and the libraries aren't so good. And also they tend to be a little slower when compared as a whole on average to languages like C, for example. So it's really a question of, okay, what are you designing for for version one? Are you designing for performance and are you designing for developer accessibility? Or are you designing for correctness and are you designing for uh, the a, a high fidelity representation of the protocol. Okay, so uh, Haskell was chosen as kind of the version one because we knew that the kinds of people who think about that are also the kinds of people that would have an easy time reading a paper like Ouroboros mm -hmm. and working their way through all of this. And they would do a pretty good job writing a formal specification and then translating that into running code. Then once you have that, you have a blueprint that you can actually reason about, maintain, and if you really wanted to, you could then turn that into a Rust code base or into a Java code base. Going the other way around would be you know, kind of, kind of pointless and counterproductive. The other side of it is that Haskell code or functional code tends to be significantly more concise. And I actually have a, a real life example of that. So if you take a look at Mantis, we, we implemented a full Ethereum node in uh, Scala. It's only about 14 or 15,000 lines of code. And you compare that with like C++ Bitcoin, I think that's 120, 150,000 lines of code. So it's almost 10 times smaller. And so less code, less to read. And you tend to read code significantly more than you would uh, read, uh, write code. So it's always an advantage for a maintenance understandability, documentation, uh, and other sort of things when you have more concise code bases. And also it's it's a lot easier for you to apply a, a stronger tools to a functional code base, uh, like static analysis or property-based testing or these types of things uh, than an imperative code base. But you know, the thing is there, it's, it's almost like a religion. It's like say, or, or language, it's like saying what's French versus Russian versus English. Everybody has their adherence. They say, oh, well, they have the best poetry here. Or, Russian, yeah, yeah. wins. There you go, always, right, Russian. Everybody has their favorite tools and their, their, their favorite languages but it just comes down to what problems are you trying to solve and what problem domain do you live in? If you're inventing new protocols based on science, 
you're going to take the time to write a paper, go through the peer review process, uh, as you've done personally, and you know how hard it can be to get into a conference and go through that and get your ass kicked, then you also have to apply the exact same level of care to the engineering side in terms of the implementation of that, or else you will make a mistake, and that mistake will probably be an exploit in the system that destroys the security properties of the system. So we really had no choice but to go to some notion of functional. The question was, what's the Goldilocks language? Do you use a hybrid language like Scala and F-sharp or Clojure, where you still have some connection to understandable things like .NET or the JVM? Or do you go to an overly academic language like Idris or Agda or you know Isabel? And in there, you can really dial up the correctness and write all kinds of crazy proofs. But by the way, it's like the seven people who write your code, they go on vacation a lot, you'll never get anything done. So Haskell kind of felt like a nice middle ground between those two, where if we needed to pull into the left, we could. If you wanted to pull into the right, you could as well. That said, it's really amazing to see what the hybrid languages have done. If I was a new student in computer science and I said, you know, learn any language to grow your career from, uh, Scala 3 is probably the language to go with. Interesting. Yeah, it's great because it's like you want it to be like Java, it's Java. And it looks kind of like a Java program. You want it to be like Python and scripted and you use a REPL, you can do that. You want to go hardcore dot, you know, de uh, dependent object types and do like weird proofs and stuff and the functional, you do all that. Mm -hmm. You have access to all of these things. And Martin Adursky is a brilliant guy. He's done some phenomenal work basically because he was a, he was one of the guys who created the JVM and he's worked on compilers for over 20 years. He, he did a lot of really hardcore work on trying to build a concise, nice, modern language that does a little bit of everything. And it's got great applications in data science and in AI. And it's also heavily used in modern companies. Like Netflix uses Scala for all of their microservice architecture. Interesting. Yeah, so there's, that's a great language. And it's easy to pick up and it's easy to hire people into it. You just find these Eastern European guys who were Java programmers for 10 years, 15 years, and they got mm -hmm. tired of making $20 an hour. So they picked up Scala so they can make $35 <laughs> an hour. And they're really good at it, you know? Yeah. And that's a great gateway drug because, you know, you have, like quick check in Haskell, you have Scala check in Scala. You know, you can also build, do model checking. You can also go and use a TLA spec and, and make it work with Scala and so forth. So it's a, it, it gets you a little bit of everything. And, you know, you can then move around that entire design space in a beautiful way. So the recommendation is... Uh... Maybe if you want to go vanilla, you go Python and JavaScript. When you're getting started. It's the getting started. Because that'll get you everything. You and can then, do web scrapers and anything. It's, it's like just all of us fun. experiment with drugs in undergrad. That's where Scala 3 comes in. It's a gateway drug to then potentially more hardcore functional languages like Haskell. Do you think C and C++, C++ still have as a role? No, I think Rust has completely Rust. replaced the need for them. Go and Rust, uh, you know, those are the, the, the two twins of doom. I mean, Google created Go. <laughs> Just to get rid of C, they, they hated C that much. And then uh, Rust is just a phenomenal language as Hate well. Hate can be a great motivator.